Welcome back to message number three in this series of, on race and what the Bible has to say about race and racism. Uh, we, the first two messages involve what the Bible has to say, giving us more of a biblical theology of what uh, race is all about. We, we discussed a number of different things in the first two messages. Number one, we talked about the fact that every human being is created by God. There's not one person who's excluded from that. We talked about the fact that every person was created in the image of God, and we talked about what that meant. It means that man has the capacity to have a relationship with his creator at a spiritual level. He's been created as a spiritual being, and thus, as a spiritual being, has the ability, the capacity to relate with God at a spiritual level, since God himself also is spirit. We talked about the fact that the Bible teaches us that every one of us is uniquely created with very unique, one-of-a-kind characteristics, from fingerprints to ear patterns to iris patterns to retinal patterns to hair color and thickness and texture, and yes, even skin color. And we talked about how melanin is the, the pigment that gives our skin the color and that there's a number of factors that determine how much melanin we have in our system and that some of that is genetically based as well as physical location, exposure to the sun. A number of things uh, will factor into how much melanin our skin will produce, but every one of them is divinely directed by God himself. And then we talked about the fact that the Bible teaches that there uh, is only one race, and that is the human race. And so then we, we took a look and answered the question as to why then does our world talk about races and um, uh, multiple number of races? Well, we, we discovered then that that began in Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel, the leadership of a, of a guy named Nimrod, who decided he was going to defy God, be against God, and, and lead the people of the world in a, in a rebellion against God. And so they built this, this huge tower on, uh, on a plain in what was called Shinar, a tower to themselves as a memorial to themselves. And yet they were, de they were defying God's orders to Noah and his family to spread out over the earth and populate the earth. And so what God did then to, to force them to go and populate the earth was that he confused their languages. And so they were not able to communicate with one another and thus complete the, the, the tower. And so they went in different directions, different people groups, based on how they were able to communicate with one another. So they grouped together based on people that they could understand. Well, that would that kind of narrowed down the gene pool. And so those people, as they intermarried and as they had kids, the genetic pool there got smaller and smaller. And more of those, the people that were produced as a result began to have more similar characteristics, similar hair texture, similar hair color, similar skin color, eye color, all and, and all of those those patterns began to, to be more similar, not identical, but more similar. And so you had these different people groups, and since one people group could not communicate with the other people group, that began this idea and the, the, the concept, given the fallen, broken nature of man's own uh, sin condition, they began to see themselves as becoming the standard. They began to see themselves as becoming the, the best. And those who looked like themselves were also grouped together and they became a we. And so there were we over here and there were them over there. Them didn't look like me, didn't look like we. And so there, there grew this we versus them. And rather than look at people as individuals created in the image of God, created to have a relationship with them, we, they began, mankind began to look at each other as groups and began to group individuals together and saying, those people are like this and those people are like that. And so this is where the seeds of racism began. This idea, this notion that there are multiple races and that there are some people that really either 
aren't a part of the human race entirely, or if they are a part of the human race, they are a substandard. They are a subspecies of the human race. And you already see how flawed that is. And so what racism does is that it literally rips apart God's original design for mankind to have a relationship with him at a spiritual level. It denies that some people have that capacity, have that ability to have that relationship at a level that is spiritual, that is unique. And, and so the result of that is that there are some people that are inferior to others. And that is, that's really what the evil of racism is. It just totally rips apart God's original design. And you contrast that idea and that notion with what we're facing today. We live in a, in a world right now driven by social media, driven by sound bites, where hostility and an absolute lack of civil, civility toward one another is the norm. And if you don't believe it, take a look at any Twitter feed, take a look at any Facebook page, and you start to see the comments and people are somehow emboldened to be rude, to be disrespectful. And if you don't think like I think, then I have the liberty to call you all sorts of names and, and charge you with all sorts of derogatory statements and false claims. And, and there's nobody that needs to go back and fact check. It becomes so uncivil. Probably you've seen that as, you, as you've gone through any number of social media. And so what, one of the favorite terms today for somebody who doesn't agree with me is that you, I can call you then. If you don't agree with me, you don't like what I say, you don't like my viewpoints, I can call you a racist. Well, that, the reason you don't agree with me is because you're racist. And the problem with that is that if everything is racist, then nothing is racist. So we have to understand the working definition of what racism is based on what we know God's word says. And let me give you a working definition of racism. It is a belief in racial superiority. In other words, based on how what my physical appearance is or what my physical people group is like or where my point of origin is or where my language uh, is similar or my ethnicity, based on that, I have an air of superiority. I am somehow, some way superior to you because I am who I am. I look the way I look. That's what racism is is really about. And it's honestly, as we look in the scripture, we're going to see a passage of this. It is a stench in God's nostrils. He hates it. Let me give you an example of this. You, you, you think, you know, there's really, you, do you remember a passage of scripture that says that God hateth racism? There's really nothing that you see there that spe speaks about racism per se, but there is an example of it, and it's in Numbers chapter 12. Very interesting, because there was what would be termed today an interracial marriage. Although God doesn't call it or consider it as any such thing. There's only one race in God's eyes, and that's the human race. But we have created these races based on skin color, or based on ethnicity, or based on points of origin, or language, or, or background. Uh, we've created that. That's a human design. God never had it, never will have it. He only has one race, and that's the human race. And so, but we see this, uh, this notion of human racism in, in Numbers chapter 12. That's when Miriam and Aaron, who, are, who you remember are the siblings of Moses, they had a problem with Moses. And you know what the problem was? Let me read you verse 1. It says, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. In case you didn't know, he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, what that means is this. Moses was not Ethiopian. He didn't look like an Ethiopian. An Ethiopian had more melanin than someone of Moses' background who was Semitic. And so there was a distinct difference in their physical appearance. And Miriam and Aaron didn't like it. 
he they didn't like that Moses' wife looked different because she had, get this, a darker skin color. And so listen to what they said in verse 2. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Now follow this now. And the Lord heard it. Now, of course, the Lord hears everything, but the Lord's about to act. And I want you to pay attention on what God's reaction is to this. Parenthetically, verse 3, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Verse 4, Suddenly, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting! Exclamation point. Can you hear me just like an angry dad? You three kids, you come over here right now. And so the three came out. Verse 5, Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. Aaron, Miriam! And so they both went forward. Now, listen to what God says now in verse 6. Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Now, how do I know that the Lord was mad? Verse 8, or verse 9. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. What does racism do in God's eyes? Makes him mad. And he has never been that vocal in his anger. You rarely see that in all of Scripture, and yet here he is, saying, you kids, come right here. Can't you just see it? Angry father just chewing out his kids. That's exactly what happened. And says, verse 10, When the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly, in which we have sinned. See, we shouldn't have been grumbling about you. We shouldn't have been saying anything about your wife because she looked differently. That was sin. We have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses, it says in verse 13, cried out to the Lord saying, Please heal her, O God, I pray. Then, verse 14, the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and afterward she may be received again. So Miriam, it says, was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again. So you see what happens here. This reaction of God to race him, it ticks him off. He was angry. Why? Because this idea of racism, that there are some people that are superior to others just simply based on their physical appearance or where they're from or how they speak, completely turns and twists and perverts his original design. And that is that every single person is created with the capacity to have a relationship with him at a spiritual level. And no one is excluded from that simply because of how they look, because the, the way they look was a part of his original design. It was a part of his masterpiece. And so the idea then of this, this notion that these false claims that I'm made more in the image of God than you, or I matter more to God than you, that all is baked into this notion that I'm somehow superior to you. I'm somehow closer to God than you because of where I'm from or because of how I speak or what language I use or what my skin color is or what my hair color is or anything else like that. 
is moreover, it's a violation of the second great commandment that Jesus gives to us. Remember what those two great commandments are? There was a, there was a young man that came to Jesus in, in Mark chapter 12 and said, Teacher, what is, the, what is the greatest commandment of all? And the Lord said, Hear, hear O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord is one. He said, Love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. Remember that? Number one commandment. And then he said, the second one is like unto it. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, you cannot love your neighbor as yourself if you somehow think that you're superior to them. That somehow because of the way that you look or because of you have more melanin in your skin or less melanin in your skin than another person or because you have a different eye color or because your ears are shaped differently or, or you speak a different language, that somehow you're superior. You see, that is not loving your neighbor as yourself. And so if we're to really get a grip on what racism is and understand how angry and how evil it is and how God is so upset by it, we need to understand just how much of a price it took to take care of the, that problem. You see, is a sin, and it's a sin that's a capital punishment. And over in Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, listen to verses 13 and 14, as Paul writes to the church there in Colossae. He says, In you, referring to the church, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You see, Jesus died for the sin of racism. He's taken it off the books, completely off the books, paid for it in full. And so, to understand how to deal with racism in our culture and understand in our society, we have to get beyond the external. We have to start. We can't start with laws and we can't start with ordinances and we can't start with new bills in Congress or anything like that because we can, we can try to, to change people's behavior all we want externally, but if we don't change the human heart, it's not going to matter one bit. It has to start in the human heart and we have to deal with it in our own hearts first before we can deal with it in anybody else's heart. And so that does, so again, remember, it's not going to matter what else we do if we don't deal with our heart issue. But here's the kicker about that. You can't change a human heart. You can't change your own heart. Because you don't know your own heart completely. You may think you know your heart, but you don't know your heart. I don't know my own heart. That's why Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 17, 9, he says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. And then he understands then that the only, the only one who can change the human heart is the Holy Spirit of God. Because the very next verse, Jeremiah 17, 10, God says this, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So guess where the Lord wants to start in addressing the whole situation of racism? He wants to start with you. He wants to start in your heart. He wants to reveal to you those attitudes, those reactions, those responses that are based in an idea of a people group that is different than you. And because they're different than you, they're somehow in some way inferior to the way that you think or the way that you believe or to your style or to your looks or, or anything like that. And sometimes those viewpoints come from past experiences, places where you were hurt, places where you suffered injustice, where you may have become bitter, where you became uh, someone who was not willing to completely forgive that wrong where you were more willing to hang on to the hurt that was caused by someone because they judged you or they were basically racist to you. 
and you're not willing to forgive them of that. And so you group everybody that looks like that person the same way. Well, they are, they're the same way as that person who hurt me. You see, Jesus died to cover all of that up. Jesus died to take all that away. Jesus died to do that. And now the Holy Spirit who lives in you wants to transform you and set you free from all that hurt, set you free from all that bitterness, set you free from all the anger and the injustice that came from that. He wants to set you free from it. Don't you want to be set free from that? The anger, the hatred, the bitterness. Don't you want to be set free from the guilt, from the shame? Maybe you are the culprit. Maybe you are the one that was unjust. Maybe you are the one who treated someone else uh, in, uh, poorly based upon how they looked or how they spoke. Then here's what we have to do. First thing is that you have to believe that Jesus alone can take away your sin and give you everlasting life. Because he died on a cross to do just that. He came to life three days later to give you life. Believe in him for it. And then if you believed in him for it, then the next thing you need to do is die to yourself. Let's get that old guy out of the way. Let's get that old gal out of the way. Let's let the new you, the one that God has always wanted you to be, always designed you to be, let that person come to the surface. And the Holy Spirit will do that. But he has to show you what has to go. So our next message, let's delve into that a little bit more with the idea and with the goal that we are going to let the Holy Spirit of God transform us and bring us into the place where we truly are the masterpiece he's always created us to be. Lord Jesus, would you change our hearts right now? Would you take away the pain? Would you take away the guilt? Would you take away the hurt and make us new again and show us how you want to transform us and bring us back to that masterpiece that you designed us to be. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for us. And we give you the praise as we pray in the power of your name. Amen. Join me the next message, and let's see how the Lord wants to work in us. <laughs>